topic area. Topic area. Just, the meetings. That's just the that's just the parallel uh, work group meetings oh. that we're going to have to prepare presentations so. tonight. I don't know what the other topic. I know Terry's probably um, you know meeting people one on one to help them debug their networks like for eight hours a day. Bodo is is supporting Loihi. So we are being live streamed now to YouTube. And Terry, will you update the link? Okay. Cool. Okay, so welcome to the penultimate day. We are starting the day with a talk by Tim Kitzman, um, who is an invitee from the Sensory Motor Integration Group. And that will be followed by work group meetings from all the groups, because tomorrow is the big day when the work group meetings present. Uh, and we also, that will start here according to schedule at 9.30 a.m. Mountain Time. And before that, we have a Sony presentation. And we start like usual at 9 a.m. with a little workshop wrap up, the Sony presentation, and then the presentations from the results of the working groups. So I'll pass it on to Bodo to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Cornelia. Yes, it is our pleasure to have with us today, Tim Keatsman. Tim uh, obtained his PhD in cognitive science at the University of Osnabrück where he then continued to work as a postdoctoral researcher in the neurobiopsychology lab of Peter Koenig. Uh, Tim then joined the MRC Cognition and uh, Brain Science Unit at Cambridge, where he is uh, a, a senior research associate now. Tim is also an assistant professor at the AI department of the Donners Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior at the Radboud University. Um, his uh, group studies the principles of neural information processing using tools from machine learning and deep learning, applied also to neuroimaging data. His research, such as the recent paper together with Nicolas Kriegsgott on deep neural networks in computational neuroscience, really uh, reveal him as a neuro neuromorph at heart. So uh, with this, we'd like to welcome mm -hmm. Tim again, and would like to give the time to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> neuromorph at heart, that's the first time I've been called that, but I'll take it. <clears throat> so let me share my screen um, and see how we get here. So let's do this. Never mind the mess on my desktop. And here. Okay. Can you see my slides? Perfect. I was told by Bodo that we have a bit of time today. So if you have any questions throughout the talk, feel free to just interrupt me um, and, and ask because I, I usually fire hose through these talks, but having a bit of time is, is nice. Okay, this is the mm, I don't think Toby? people are recording. Uh, now, <laughs> now we are recording. <laughs> Good. So um, the talk is called Recurrence as a Key Architectural Component for Modeling the Dynamics of Human Object Recognition. And again, if you have any questions at any point in time, just shout, um, raise your hand right in the chat. I assume Bodo will be half monitoring the chat and let me know if, if there's anything. Okay, so let's start with an, an intuition. Um, I'll show you an image, and within the fraction of a second, you'll explore the image, and your brain will start extracting meaning from that image. You'll realize that there's a lake, a boat, a man, a woman, a fish, all of these things your brain will, you know, almost automatically, without you actively doing it, extract meaning. You'll probably also see that the woman, there's also social interactions going on. The woman may be a bit, a bit shocked about the man's love for, for this fish. So, and the, the fact that you can do this is quite remarkable because you've never, obviously never seen this image before. Um, it's just a bunch of pixels that I'm showing you and still you can, you know, extract these rich semantics um, at a very fast pace. Uh, your visual system is very versatile. Again, you can extract basic object categories, um, guide motor action, uh, extract social relations, all that stuff. It's quite versatile. It's very reliable. Um, uh, 
Uh, it's very energy efficient, as you're all aware. It's very data efficient uh, in terms of data efficiency. You know, we, we train a lot of deep nets in the lab and um, on object recognition tasks, um, predominantly on, on object recognition tasks. And when we train our deep nets, 100 epochs on one and a half million images, which is one of the typical data sets that we play with. I did the math at some point and thought, okay, if I sat down with my daughter and I showed her an image, one image a second, and I asked her, you know, I told her, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a table, this is a chair. Um, and I showed her as many images as this deep net is seeing. Um, and we did it, you know, 16 hours a day without pauses. It would still take us seven years to go through sitting with my daughter, just holding up little images and telling her what things are. Go, go through the yeah. same visual experience. But Tim, as, that's not a fair comparison at all. You know, because I'm, I'm you're aware. alive and awake 12, 13 hours a day, continually getting visual input. That's fair. It's, it's that's, not, fair. that's not a valid, I don't agree with that comparison at all. It's just, it was just that, giving you an example of, of, of how much visual experience the deep nets have today. Obviously there's, there's, there's genetic um, elements, there's connectivity motifs, there's, you know, simple and complex cells developing in the womb. I'm, I'm, I'm well aware. So, so let's, let's scratch the, if you don't like the example, we, we can agree to disagree. Um, but I, I agree that my daughter's not starting from zero and the deep net is. So I, I, I'll take it. Um, so we're quite data efficient still. So I could show you a new category of things and say, this is a WUBA. And uh, you would, you know, by seeing only two or three of them, you would, you would um, easily pick that up. Even a fully trained deep net won't be able to, to do that. Um, as easily with very little um, experience. So maybe that's a better exp example here. The question that we're asking the lab is how does the brain do that? And can we kind of take that and, and push it onto um, machines and make machines do the same or, or behave in a similar way as, as humans do? And in the lab, deep nets are, are very central to what we're doing. And um, we're and in Germany, you say, of zwei Hochzeiten tanzen, we try to dance on two weddings at once. Uh, we hope that by using deep nets as a core element um, of our work, we can use them to further our understanding of the brain in terms of computational neuroscience, but we might also be able to learn a trick or two from looking at the brain and improve um, machine learning applications or computer vision applications. And DNNs really are a, a powerful uh, tool or powerful framework for us because Every model that we train is typically trained on a, on a proper visual task, which means that we are very close to the application while still trying to gain neuroscientific, uh, neuroscientific insights. So that they, I, I see them as a unified language that's shared between computational neuroscience and, and ML. Um, so why deep nets? Well, this is an old hat for, for all of you, um, but I'm still showing it because there's an important point. Um, Deep nets have entered, have been around for a very long time, but uh, entered the collective consciousness again in uh, in 2012 when when Alex Krzyzewski, um, uh submitted what's now known as AlexNet to ILS VRC and and uh, achieved a very remarkable performance at a basic level object recognition task, which is you know tell of a given image which one of a thousand categories is shown in that image. And uh, ever since then, people haven't turned back. And the, the, this challenge was won by AlexNet. And it, you know, no non-deep network approach has since won this challenge. So the DNNs really revolutionized computer vision. And the reason for that, and now I'm, I'm slowly coming to the point I'm making, the reason for that is that when I started in computer vision a few years, well, many years back, uh, we would sit down, we would look at a problem, and we would think about, you know, what are the features that we need to solve this task? If do you want to recognize fruit? Well, maybe color histograms and, and major axis rotation is something that you want to look at. Um, you know, we, we would sit down and, and be creative and think about solutions of how we could, you know, what features we could engineer to then train our classifiers on, on its support vector machines, logistic regression, nearest neighbor, you know, learning vector quantization, these things. The difference to DNNs is that um, they're, they're, we can train them now on GPUs with a lot of data uh, end to end, right? So you train not only the classifier, but you train all the features as well. So we're not limited in that sense by our create, own creativity anymore because the networks will try to find features that are useful for a given task and train them end to end again, from pixel all the way up to the classifier. And that's an interesting point because in neuroscience, we're facing a very similar question. 
So when you study, and I, you know, I, I grew up so I'm sort of dancing in between these two fields, but in neuroscience, a lot of uh, characterization of what neurons in the visual system are doing, we try to give them human semantic labels. We would say this is a face selective cell, or this is a body part selective cell or a scene selective cell, right? That doesn't really work for a lot of cells. It doesn't work for intermediate vision. It doesn't work well for low level vision. For low level vision, we said, okay, it's maybe a bit like a Gabor wavelet. And so now we have Gabor models, but it turns out that um, as much as we're limited by our imagination, we're limited by our imagination and computer vision, we are similarly limited if we try to only use human derived concepts to explain neural selectivity in the ventral stream or in the visual system. And deep nets give us a good tool of overcoming this. We can train a deep net on a given task, let's say object categorization, and then we can ask how well do the features that this network learns align with what the human brain is doing? That's known as the normative approach. We are asking not what is the brain area selective for, but what is the objective maybe that um, leads that we can train networks on that can explain why, let's say a given brain region might have developed the sort of selectivity that it does, right? And DNNs are great for that because we can train a model again end to end on a given task and then ask how similar is it to the brain? Which regions match? What do we need to change about the architecture, about the input statistics, about the learning rule? to and then always compare against brain data right and that's the sort of game we're in um, always asking how can we um, improve models of the brain by taking this normative approach so tim i have a question this andreas yeah, please. Uh, is motivated by your your statistics of usage of the words we're training end to end we're training end to end you're using that phrase all over and over and over again so could you envision envision another so is end-to-end -end training really what gives us the benefit or is deep neural networks? Could I take out the boxes in the last row and put something else there that would be trained end-to-end that is not DNN that will actually do the job? Um, I, I guess um, it's a good question. So I guess the, the following a certain learning gradient that optimizes a certain function will always be required to do you know, this end-to-end -end training. So is there a question, can we do end-to-end -end training other than with deep nets or other yes, than- yes, yes, with some other box, you know, I mean, pick up your favorite other machine learning mm -hmm. uh, model. Um, I guess, so one of the issues is that if you have a simple, I mean, simple linear models like support vector machines or, or um, you know, logistics. Or something like Bayesian models. I mean, you could put a little box there to do Bayesian mm -hmm. inference. And then that would have to learn all features from the pixels all the way up, right? Well, I mean, hey, you know. Anyway, just something that I just occurred to me. You can think about it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good one. I have yet to fully understand the question, I think. But, but currently, the, what DNNs do... Um, is giving us a solution or a way to train end-to-end -end models, right? You can also use genetic algorithms. You don't have to backprop, right? There's many different ways of training models, um, but this is just, just one way of how we can do it. Tim, another quick question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned comparing this to the neuroscience data. What source of data do you use for training? Yeah, that's on the next slide. That's a great, right. that's a great segue. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So um, it turns out that that people who are in, in the field of cognitive computational neuroscience have taken these models that are given to us by, um, by computer vision like AlexNet and they asked, okay, um, can we actually compare the internal structures that are, that are learned, you know, the low level, mid and high level features to brain data? And it turned out that this works quite well. So here in the top left, what I'm showing, okay, now you should see my cursor. In the top left, I'm showing you work by, from, from Nico Kriegesport's lab as well, um, with Sayed Khalik Rasavi being the lead author. What they did was they computed uh, representational dissimilarity matrices. This approach is known as, as RSA, representational similarity analysis. The idea is that you show a whole set of images to a person in the scanner. In this case, it is um, human IT, so it's fMRI data and you record brain pattern brain activations in let's say inferior temporal cortex. And then you ask how similar is the response of the brain to let's say the picture of a pineapple and the picture of a dog, right? And you remember this 
And if you show a large set of stimuli, like I'm showing you here, this is 92 different stimuli from various different categories. You can compute all pairwise distances um, in the pattern response and, and fill this matrix like that. And that matrix characterizes how similarly the brain, this brain region responds to a certain set of stimuli. You can, for instance, see the top left quadrant being more blue, let's say, right? And that would say that those are all animate things. So this brain area, human IT, would um, have a smaller distance of all animate things when you compare the distances within animate things to distances crossing the animacy boundary. So over to inanimate things, which would be these distances here. Right? So there's a certain structure in how IT responds, and these RDMs are a great way of summarizing the population response over a large set of stimuli. They're basically telling you, if a brain region cares about a certain distinction, then the patterns should be quite different. If a brain region doesn't care about a distinction, then the similarities should be quite small, because the patterns will be the same, irrespective of what the stimulus is. Right? And the, the good thing about RDMs like or RSA is that you can not only apply this to fMRI data, you can also do the very same thing on deep nets. So you show the exact same stimuli that you were showing to um, the brain and the scanner to a deep net that's trained on a task and you extract pattern distances. And then um, what happens is that these deep nets, um, later layers in, in AlexNet, for instance, in this case, would show a very similar um, population uh, or let's say geo population geometry. So it's, the, it's very similar distances among things. Animate things would cluster and so on and so forth, right? Why, why of, is it called, why, sorry to interrupt, why is it called IT geometry supervised in this? Oh, that's uh, because this is a very specific way of, of the model. It's, I didn't want to go into too much detail here. It's, uh, you can use AlexNet and we'll show something like this in the later layers. In this case, I think, <clears throat> what they did in addition was to reweigh the feature maps in a cross-validated manner to kind of improve the fit even more. Um, but just out of the box, AlexNet is also um, quite good. And I'll show you our own models later on where we don't do any of this fitting business, but just show how out of the box things um, may work. Um, in the bottom left, you see something that's known as an encoding model. That's um, so Nico uh, used to be my, my um, supervisor at, in Cambridge. Now this in the bottom left is now worked by a colleague now at the Donders, Umut Gütschli, uh, with Marcel van Gerven. They've run an encoding model, basically trying to predict individual voxel activations in the human brain by based on a feature space that's spanned by a deep net. And what they've shown is that you can explain early visual cortex, that you can explain variants in early visual cortex regions of the human brain well with earlier layers in a model. And you see this cascade, so to say, where later regions in the brain are better explained by later regions, uh, later layers in a, in a deep net. So it's not only that they reach a similar solution. Is that the co Sorry, is that, I just don't understand the axes. This is the colossum in the middle and it's surrounded by V1, V2, V4 and so on? This is, this is looking down on cortex? This is a flattened map. Yeah, you cut the you you take the uh, cal you cut the cortex. The calcarine sulcus should be um, right at the middle, going to left okay. to the left and to the right, and you flatten the basically visual cortex. So the occipital cortex, you flatten that out, so you see up uh, to the temporal, in the temporal direction in the left and right hemisphere, and you see early visual cortex V one V two and then all the way up to L O, um, in this plot. Okay. The main point is that that if you use deep nets, in this case, it's it's VGG, but it's it's again trained on the same task of this, you know, ILS VRC. You can use encoding models. You can do with RSA. It's it's somewhat astonishing that they do allow us for this alignment, or at least at, at the day it was quite astonishing because they were never trained to do the same as what brains would be doing. They were trained to do object categorization, and but you can find a linear mapping. That's what the bottom says. You can find a linear mapping to explain variance in the brain data using the deep net as a as basis function. Or in the top left, it says that the brain has a similar geometry in its responses to what deep nets may be doing. And that doesn't only work for humans. That also works for for other uh, primates and macaques, for instance. This works quite well. And this is work from Dan Yamans, um, showing a very similar. Um, Making, making a very similar point that you can explain up to 50% of variance in V4 and in, in, in IT um, if you use deep nets as a basis function to predict this basic GLM stuff. So ever since these papers came out, um, 
everybody everywhere is using them to explain brain data um, in vision. So feed forward networks are everywhere um, as guilty as many others are. And most people use these forward architectures trained to categorize. And the question is, why would you use those? Like if we if you know anything about the about um, you know the visual cortex, it's it's not a feed forward system that's trained to only categorize. So why is it that everybody was using them? And I call this computational convenience, right? 2014, it was incredibly hard to train those things. It was incredibly hard to um, you know, train them at scale also. So um, we got these models from computer vision and we saw how far can we push this using the computer vision models. Now, the question is, does that have limits? And this is a, a project with Kate Storrs, who you see in the, in the top right, um, where we said, okay, let's just take fMRI data from the human inferior temporal cortex, which is a high level, again, high level visual regions in the brain, in the human brain. And um, let's use a whole bunch of different networks, you know, AlexNet, VGG, Google Net, ResNet, and so on and so forth. And let's, let's look at if we allow a bit of flexibility in how we map those models onto brain data by um, reweighting. So this is again, our, using RSA, which I showed you on the previous slide, to see how good are these models in predicting or, or resembling brain data, right? You show these, these stimuli for the first time, to the model and you ask, okay, how similar are these geometries? And it turns out if you allow a bit of flexibility in, in the fitting and you cross-validate properly, leaving stimuli out and leaving certain subjects out uh, for testing purposes, um, basically all networks perform well if you train the networks on a task and you allow a bit of flexibility in fitting. Um, and that's the main point of this paper is that all feedforward models perform similarly well if you allow training and fitting. So. What does that leave us with? It, it says that, <clears throat> and these are quite different architectures, right? The, the unifying thing about these architectures is that they're all feed forward. So the whole class of feed forward networks um, is, is quite capable of explaining brain data, but where do we go next? What should we do next? Um, Tim, can I ask a question oh, here? So sure. I'll go ahead, ask. All right. So um, we've heard earlier uh, in this workshop a talk by uh, uh, from the group at uh, MIT from Jim DiCarlo, who yeah. came up with this brain score. I'm sure you're familiar with yeah. that. Yeah. I was wondering how that fits in here because um, they seem to show that some feedforward architectures perform better than others others at predicting these uh, neural uh, recordings. So what's your yeah. take on that? Yeah, it's an interesting, um, so it's an interesting question. So I think so first of all, we have in the paper we have I don't have I didn't bring them today, but in the paper we have correlations of brain score with how we can and brain score is again based on primates and encoding models, and we do RSA and humans here, so um, it's not directly comparable and there's not a great correlation either between which models, uh, which feed forward models do well on brain score and this thing. So. Um, I'm a fan of brain score. I I think it's. It's very tricky. It's very tricky. Brain score is an encoding model. It allows for a lot of parameters to be fitted. We have very much fewer parameters uh, here. So that's one big difference. There's quite a few differences. And I, I can't really tell you um, what the main predominant difference is. I would also think that if you push those different deep nets enough, you would probably also say that in brain score, they are all quite comparable, right? And brain score now includes behavior, for instance, not only IT, right? They include V4, V1, behavior, all these things that together give you a more nuanced view on these deep nets, right? This is just IT in humans. This isn't, um, you know, um, putting all of that together on score. All That's right, maybe one big difference. More questions? But you asked a question and now you're, are you asking the audience to speculate also before you show us what your answer is? No, I'm, I'm asking if there's more questions because you seem to have a question and I wanted to be polite and allow you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, no, you show us then. Yeah. Okay, well, so, so our solution, and this is similar similar developments to, again, Jim DiCarlo's lab, um, who we're kind of, the Jim is, Jim's lab is, is focusing a lot on macaques and we're focusing a lot on humans. Um, and our in our view, uh, the solution is, is, is about time, it's about recurrence. So, um, and that's something that's true of, of brain score as well. So newer computer vision networks perform better at object classification, but they're not better at predicting brain data. And that is a correlation that in early days of brain score, 
has been shown where um, you know, models that perform better at the task were also better at explaining brain data. But if you look at the neuro publications of brain score, the models that now do like way better, they're not better models of the brain anymore. So that correlation is broken in the newer models. And what does that leave us with? Well, I take from it that this suggests that engineering and neuroscience have started to diverge again. Engineers come up with better and better solutions to the problem. Um, but it doesn't mean that those better solutions, engineered better solutions to the problem, are better models of the brain. So um, the question is, what do DNNs need to make? What do they need to make them better at both mirroring brain data and computer vision performance? Right? If we want, to, if that was our task to do both, to get robust vision that mirrors humans, which is kind of what the game that we're in, what would what we have to do? We can't take the newest computer vision model because those are starting to get worse at predicting brain data, or at least not better. And our take is, well, the visual system is, is largely recurrent and it includes a lot of top-down and lateral connections. And maybe we can, we can think of recurrent connectivity of one ingredient that we can add to these models to move away from this class of feedforward models. Uh, the same is true, by the way, for brain score, right? There's coronet R, um, uh, coronet Z, there's different ver variants, also recurrent variants of it that do quite well. And so this is this is a similar suggestion here. Um, so um, recurrence allows us to use time as a computational resource. Maybe we can use this to get better at, at predicting brain data. But the question is really, if you say, let's add biology back into, so that's the main narrative here, right? So if, if engineering has run away with deep nets and all of a sudden the new engineered models are not better at the brain, and we say, let's add biology back in and see how far we can push this. The question is, what do we, what parts of biology do we want to put in? And this is a slide that uh, is heavily inspired by, um, by a slide that Jim uh, DiCarlo also uh, uses. Um, so, you know, if you ask me, I would say, you know, population dynamics are, are quite important um, and maybe this will help us get, get to better models. Um, but then, you know, you go out and you talk to the neurobiologist and they would say, no, spikes are important. And, you know, this is probably the right workshop for this also, um, where, you know, you have to have spiking neural networks and otherwise, why do you even try? And then you go on and then, you know, you speak to people who say, well, you know, dendritic computation, that's where it's at. That's what you should be modeling. And then you got on channels and you got on protons and it, it, it never ends. So the question is, what's the right level of biological detail that we would want to put into these models to make them better at this task? And this is a very high level uh, task of, of, you know, object recognition here or object classification. The point is that none of this is a fact. It's, it's a question of how you would like to look at the data and how would you like to look at the problem? What's the sort of level of detail that you're willing to operate on? And what's the sort of level of detail that you would like to spend your GPU memory on, right? And for us, we start at the top. We look at popula population dynamics first. We take the models, the convolutional networks, and we expand them to be similar in terms of population dynamics. And then we see how far it can get before we add um, potentially unnecessary biological detail, let's say. So we take this top-down route um, and we'll see how far we can push it. Um, which is helpful because this allows us to stay quite close to, to the status quo in machine learning. We can use all, you know, uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow and all these developments, we can take them and use them to, to get, be quicker at training, get more robust training. By the so way, what, what are we, yeah? That's a comment. By the way, computer architects, when they design computer architectures, that's how they do it. They, they start at the high level and they go and put details in the models to really help them optimize the architecture. So. That is a very reasonable thing. I mean, way to go. That's good. Um, <clears throat> I I get a lot of questions about the about the Blue Brain project at this pro at this point usually, but let's just skip that. Um, the so the question is, what are we up to? What what do I want my models to do? If I say I want neural population dynamics to be mirrored, right? What's what what is it that I mean? And this is a paper we we published um, about two years ago, where we looked into this. What I mean is that if I were to characterize human computations in terms of these representational dissimilarity matrices that you see here, um, if I had a matrix for each millisecond of computation in a given brain region, I would get a whole movie of them, right? I could see how the code changes in an area over time. We call those RDM movies. 
And ideally, if I had the perfect model, you know, a given layer of the model would show the exact same RDM movie as, you know, early visual cortex. And a higher layer would show the same RDM movie as intermediate um, regions of the of the ventral stream, let's say. And if I, you know, if I could wish for something, then also high level representation should follow what IT is doing. And they all should do it jointly in one model. And that's a tricky task because whatever this layer is computing needs to somehow be transformed in two steps into something, whatever the brain is computing here. They all need to work in harmony together. So that's the task. And what we would like to ask is what architecture should we be using to do this? There's a whole zoo of different possibilities of how we could implement and test this. So we have a very crude idea. We'll take some brain data and we'll try to take some candidate architectures and we'll enforce as much as we can. We'll train them up end to end again to mirror the human brain dynamics as much as possible. We're not training them on an external task, which is what we did before, right? We took networks and we trained them on a computer vision task. Now we train them to do as brain-like as possible. And some architectures will be well able to do that and others will fail. And so the idea is if you would like to kind of find out what parts of an architecture help a network to be brain-like, then you can push them and test how well they, if you push them, how well they're able to. That's the reasoning. So. We don't you, with, Tim, yeah. don't you have a, a very bad source of data for these uh, temporal dynamics in these different areas? Your data sucks, doesn't it? You have extremely coarse sampling of it, and they're not from the same experiments. Isn't you, it difficult? Well, so let me let me go one slide further, and then we'll we'll talk again. So that's the data we use. Um, you're you're good with with segways today. So we we contact Radek Chihe at MIT who had collected MEG data from human participants, a whole bunch of human participants, multiple sessions per person. And he showed these 92 images um, that I showed you earlier to people in the MEG and collected um, you know, MEG data from them for all these stimuli. And what we added was um, uh, source reconstruction te techniques, very basic minimum norm. Um, and we define regions of interest. We're not saying that we can easily disentangle, let's say, V1 and V2 with MEG. That would be, especially at, at, at small images that you're showing, you're in this, you're, you're in, the, in the foveal element, and it's really hard to tell apart these regions, even with fMRI in the fovea. So let's not do that. Let's just take V1, 2, and 3, chunk them together and say, this is early vision, early visual cortex, right? Let's do the same for V4 and LO and IT and parahippocampal complex. And so those are three main big regions that are also far enough apart so that we think we can reasonably tell them apart with MEG, right? We're not trying V1 and V2. We're trying inter early, intermediate, and high level. And now what we do is once we have the source projection, we, um, we do this RSA trick that I showed you before. So we take the re brain responses, the pattern response in early visual cortex to let's say an elephant and a pineapple is what I'm showing in the bottom. And... Um, we ask, okay, how similar was the response in early visual cortex to the, uh, the response to the elephant? How similar was that to the response of the pineapple? And that's just one cell in this RDM. And we can fill this whole thing up and we have a resolution of 1200 Hertz so we can do this in time, right? And I can show you a movie of how distances between objects change in early visual cortex, intermediate and high level visual cortex. Next, that make sense? And that will be our and, data that and, we are and, pushing into the networks at some point. But again, these are like easily recognizable things that you just flash up. There's no eye movement yeah. here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're this not allowed to scan over. Eye no, no, no. Fixed eye movements, very small images flashed onto the screen. Uh, people have a, a, a task of, uh, I think uh, sometimes Clippy was shown, which, which not everybody will remember, but there was a time where Clippy was on Word and it annoyed everybody. And if, if Clippy came on screen, they had to press a button. But it's a very basic core, there's no um, ambiguity in these objects in the sense that that you it would take you a lot of time. It's like an impulse response really to this. Um, yeah, but it turns out that, that your brain in a few hundred milliseconds is doing a whole lot of different things with this stimulus, despite having only the, you know, there's semantics that go with these stimuli and so on and so forth. So let's look at some of the, the movie data here. Um, what I'm showing you is three columns and I hope that works via Zoom. I'm showing you three columns um, one is uh, early visual cortex uh, over here, uh, intermediate and high level. This is going to be the RDM movie. This is just noise right now because we're at time zero milliseconds from the stimulus. They'll, there's just nothing at cortex yet. 
And I used these distances to compute a uh, multidimensional scaling solution. Um, the animate things will be uh, colorful and the inanimate will be blue. And I'm showing you the stimuli, same MDS solution, just showing the stimuli in the, in the bottom there. And we'll now look at a video and I'll stop at some, at, at some points to point things out. But this is just for you to get a feeling of the sort of data we're modeling. I don't want to discuss this data uh, too much because we'll run out of time, but this is what we'll be modeling. Okay, so this is stimulus onset at zero milliseconds. You see not much happening because it's signal haven't reached cortex yet. And now at about 50 milliseconds in or so, you see some subtle structure emerge, right? Where some stimuli seem to, to cluster a little bit, having low distances. And those are all the faces. They look very, very similar. Um, it's not that we have high level facial selectivity at this point. It's just they have eyes and nose and mouth in roughly the same location, which, you know. Um, okay, and we move on. We have some signal to work with now after 50 milliseconds or so. And you see that this code changing over time, we're now going close to 200 milliseconds. At 120 or so, 130 milliseconds, you can see that in, in you know, intermediate and high level visual cortex, uh, quite dominantly, faces become very distinct from everything else. Um, so in the bottom, in the MDS plot, you can see quite nicely that the little points that are the faces that are the dark red, they move out of everything. They're just quite, quite different. And now we can move on. Um, what you'll see next is in, in high level visual cortex, you see this, this big quadrant emerge, which is all animate things being close together now. Um, and at a later point in time, you'll see this animacy clustering reappear in, in V4 LO and in, in intermediate level visual regions. You mean living versus non-living by animate? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Animal, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's human faces, human body parts, animal faces, animal body parts. Yeah. It's not plants. That would be inanimate, natural. Yeah. Okay, so, so, there's, so there's a whole whole lot of stuff happening in these. And I've looked at them thousands of times, and I still recognize little little things about it. When we've, we've used, um, you know, hypothesis-driven modeling, and we applied Granger causality to this to look at how areas might interact, and that's all in this in this paper, but today I want to talk about how we model it with deep nets. So if, uh, if, just a quick question. How did you yeah. choose these particular two, four, six, eight uh, categories? Uh, this is an existing image data set that has been used for quite a while. It's, it's since 2008, people have been using this. I see. Um, and it's, it's yeah, it's, it's just a, it's overused at this point, to be honest, but it's uh, what we could get our hands on. I'm, I'm not, in, I'm not, um, in the in the business of collecting great MEG data, but more in the modeling business. So this. No, is... I'm talking about the categories. I mean, would you come yeah. up with? Would you have different categories if you were to actually pick categories? I would. I mean, if I were to redo this, I would probably also not show segmented images, but images in natural background and whatnot. Okay. So a larger you. variety of them, you know. And then yeah. these data are being collected, for instance, by Martin Hebert in Leipzig right now. But um, this is what we had um, a few years back when we started this project. Okay, so let's ask now, how can we take these data that I just showed you and force them into a model? And the idea is, is quite simple. We call it representational distance learning or dynamic representational distance learning in this case. The idea is the following. If I'm showing an elephant and a pineapple again to a brain region, I can estimate the distance between the patterns as being, let's say, 0.8, right? That's a made up number. It gets a distance. And I can show the same two to um, a deep net and I can ask, what's the distance for the deep net? And let's say I come up with a distance of 0.2. What we realized is that we could take that as an error. We could say the network weights should be changed so that the distance is 0.8, not 0.2. And now you can do this not only for elephants and pineapples, you can do this for all possible pairs of these stimuli and try to enforce the whole geometry of what you see in the brain into a network if it's able to do that, right? And that's what we're doing. So if you've I'm anticipating a question on, on number of parameters and number of stimuli here, because our deep maps have, have a lot of parameters and these are 92 stimuli. So how do we get away with that? Um, here's a bit of a trick. We assume um, that, so we collected a new data set um, for training. We take for each category in the MEG data, let's say hand, we collected a thousand images of hands or for person, a thousand images of people or for armadillo, we collected a thousand images of armadillos and so on and so forth. So this gives us 142,000 images that we found is 9.8 billion unique pairs. And now whenever we've shown an elephant and a pineapple, 
to the brain will take a an elephant and, and a pineapple that's not the ones we showed in the in the experiment and we train on that right so we overfit to the categories but not to the stimuli right so the models once we've trained them will have never seen the exact stimuli that we showed to people in um in the scanner and in addition what we do is we train we do this rdl trick and we enforce it into networks with this data set uh, using half of the data and then we test how well it predicts the other half of the data also now here's two possible architectures those those were two that we were interested in at the time um, note that if you took a feed forward network which is how i how i started my talk if you took a feed forward network it wouldn't um, give you any dynamics, right? Each layer is computing its one thing, it's one scalar product and a ReLU nonlinearity, and then you go on. It, that's boring if you want to explain dynamics. So it's kind of a um, not a great target, let's say. So what we did was we had two types of models. One we call ramping feed forward. What does that mean? It means that each unit in a given layer of a feed forward model has a connection to itself and it can learn to ramp up its activity over time. There's no lateral interaction or top-down interaction whatsoever. It's technically a recurrent model, but information flow is strictly feed forward or within the unit, not across units. Um, and we thought, you know, this gives you quite, you know, non-linear dynamics already if you allow for that, because different units and different layers reach thresholds at different times and whatnot. Um, so that's the one model we use. And the other model we use has feed forward, top-down, and um, lateral connections. We call them BLT bottom up lateral and top down so now but can i just ask yeah do you have kernels for those connections or is, is it all point to point between no the, no, no. Uh, they, they are, these are these are all kernels so it's it's um yeah so you once have the kernel for for bottom up you have all feature maps in a previous layer and a local you know Five, three by three, five by five kernel that goes onto that, that's learnable onto that unit. Same goes for lateral. You can just use the unit activation from your, from your feature maps in the same layer in the vicinity. So around that unit as lateral connection, you can do the same trick top down. It's basically an unrolled um, convolutional network if you want with weight sharing. Thank you. So it's, it's, it's still in the whole convolutional domain. It's not non-convolutional. It's just we, we unroll the network and then put connections in the right way so they are, and do weight sharing so that layer one can talk to layer two and layer two can talk to layer one. A natural question. I hope you don't mind if I ask this technical. So it's not a conf LSTM recurrent network. In other no, words, no, you no. don't have these gating units and yeah, you don't nothing. have these uh, no. memory units. Yeah, no. Uh, we found those to be a bit- weight sharing. Right. Yeah, so this, this if, you had, if you added LSTMs, it would be a it would feel to me a bit cheaty also because they can just flick their memory on and off and if this network is trying to maintain any activation it would have to actively flow in the network and be maintained you can't so um, so you say it's would you characterize like a vanilla or a vanilla convolutional or, or yeah, current network if you want it yeah okay. it's 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 like a vanilla recurrent network with convolutional kernels if you want well, thank you. Yeah. You said earlier that you, there's no lateral connections. What do you? Lateral connection in the in the top one, there's no connections of a given unit and a given layer to its neighboring units. Neighboring in unit bottom, cannot. In the bottom, there is. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do is, uh, I'll I'll now plot. Um, so you've seen this this RDM movie in the previous slide, right? These how these representations changed. And what I do is to summarize this is I'll take the average distance for each frame and just plot it over time. And that's what you see here um, in black. So this would be the MEG data. You see that the average distance uh, goes down um, uh, initially, and then there's nonlinear changes in how these distances in the different regions how these distances change. Distance is this distance um, between object pairs again? It's, what, what is um, it? It's basically um, yes, exactly. So it's it's basically taking this matrix, taking the upper triangle, and taking the average of it, and then through time that average will change. Okay. And then I'm just plotting that, basically plotting that average, and. Um, now, this is training the recurrent models and the ramping feed forward models on one half of the data using this RDL that I described earlier. And what you can see, let's look at V4, for instance, you can see that 
the blue, or in IT even more, the blue stiff ramping feed forward motor, they do have nonlinearities in, in the way that they interact, but at some point they just, all units have reached that threshold and they just hang out as a good, at a good average, whereas the recurrent models can quite nicely follow these, these dynamics. Can I ask a technical question? What prevents yes. these now these recurrent networks from exploding? You know, since they potentially can have positive feedback, why don't they yeah. explode and get positive um, eigenvalues? If that so, there's two objectives. There's the RDL objective, and there's a categorization objective on it as well. And I suspect so. There's cross entropy going in as one objective that you inject, and then the other thing is that this R RDL objective is going in every time. So you take the unrolled network and then for every layer, for every time point, you have a distance target. So you're quite, you're, you're regularizing the model quite severely by enforcing at every possible depth, human data into the model. Okay, so you just punish instability. You just train uh, yeah. it so if, if it were to stable. become instable, you would move away from the target RDM of the human brain data and then that would be punished in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, and so the, there's, there's much more quantitative stuff that we do in the paper that I don't have the time to go into now, but the take home message that we took from this is that if you wanted to model these dynamics in the human brain, then you can't do just feed forward models as at the time when we started this, which is quite a few years back, everybody was just doing feed forward models and we thought that's, you know, you need more. And so recurrent connectivity is one, let's say, direction that you could, that you could look into. Now I'm seeing I'm running out of time, so I'll I'll speed up a little bit for the for the um, for the next part. What I've shown you is still recurrent models. What I've shown you before, or what I've told you, is that maybe we can take inspiration from the brain and and you know improve computer vision or get better matched to human behavior or so because we we've seen that this sort of breaks at at you know newer engineered models. So this is what we did with with Courtney Spora, who is a, a PhD student um, of of Nico and I, and um, he basically took three more, took a, a bottom-up convolutional, vanilla convolutional model, and he added lateral connections. So this is, we call BL, bottom-up and lateral. Now, and the idea is let's train them both on a, on a big data set like, like ImageNet and see which one is better. The problem is, and, and you know, again, we hope that recurrent connectivity being bio-inspired would help us a little bit in getting better performance. The issue here is that if you add lateral connections, you'll add a whole lot of parameters to the model. And so maybe your model is just better because it's way heavier in terms of parameters. For reference, the B model has 11 million parameters. BL has 30 million parameters. So it's triple the number of parameters. So I'm, you know, if I would tell you that, that it's better, you would probably say, well, yeah, it just has more parameters. So that's not, you know. So what we did is we added three bottom up models in an attempt to match the number of parameters in various different ways. BK would be, adding larger kernels to the early layers. So instead of you know, five by five, you do seven by seven. That increases the number of parameters quite dramatically, especially in early layers. You could also take the same number of layers and kernel sizes. You just add more feature maps per layer. That will increase your number of parameters very easily. Or BD would be just, just make the network double as deep. And that's what you do, right? And those have, uh, BK has 40 million parameters, BF has 40 million, and BD has 30 million parameters. So we're in the right ballpark now to do this comparison. Now, when we train these on ImageNet, um, note that we, we cut the axis here at, at 0.5, um, but what you can see, is, sorry, I can't see my own screen. <laughs> what you can see is that um, B is doing okay at like 58, BK is doing worse on the test set, and that's because it overfit. Um, it overfit because spending a lot of parameters on large kernels early on isn't a smart investment of your parameters. Um, BF is doing better, so adding feature maps is better, um, is a good investment of parameters. BD uh, is an even better investment of parameters, uh, but adding lateral connections is yet a better investment of parameters. And again, um, we can have quite deep models. Uh, these, I think, had four time steps. But since we do weight sharing, we don't add more parameters to the model, right? Um, but then, you know, if I present this, people say, <clears throat> yeah, but you know, now it's a recurrent model. So it, it's, I have to wait for longer. I mean, that's, um, that's one of the arguments we got. You know, it's, it's recurrent, you have to wait. So, so what gives? So what we did was we plotted the number of floating point operations that you need to do to do inference on a given model against the accuracy. And then 
the um, like here would be an instance of, of VD, the best feed forward model that has a certain number of floating point operations and it operates at, at like, I don't know, 62 point something, 63. Now with a recurrent model, it's a bit different because we can stop it from computing at various time steps. Right? We can say only do one time step, only do two, three, and so on and so forth. And what we did here was uh, we set an entropy threshold. So we looked at the, and this is a bit of a technical detail, um, but we looked at the probability distribution over all categories at the output, the softmax output of the model. And then we compute the entropy of that. If the model is very, very certain as to what something is, it'll have a probability of one for one category and zeros otherwise. Um, and if it's a uniform, a distribution that changes the entropy quite dramatically of that probability distribution, obviously. So we started with a high entropy threshold and we lowered it and lowered it and lowered it and lower entropy means the model is more certain as to what the object is. And now you can just say, okay, over this set of test images, stop when you've reached this entropy level or you've gone lower than that threshold in terms of entropy. And you can see that if you have a very high entropy threshold, which means the model is quite uncertain, It'll start, it'll stop earlier, you know, lower number of floating point operations, but it also won't be as good in doing the task. If you lower the entropy threshold, you'll see that the model gets better and better and better, but it also takes longer and longer and longer to compute. The interesting thing for us here was not only that we can stop the model at various time steps once it's certain enough, but the interesting thing is that this curve that is this, the, the color of the curve again encodes the entropy threshold is more or less cutting through what the feed forward models are, which means we can stop it at a time that fits the complexity in terms of floating point operations of a feed forward model and be just as good, but we can also decide to let it run for longer and get even better, right? Which is not a given because you train the model on the whole four time steps. It's not a given that after one time step, it would be as good as a feed forward model because again, we do weight sharing over time. So it's not guaranteed to do that, but it, it turns out it did this for two large scale image sets that we tested. Now. The last thing I want to talk about uh, is that once you realize that you can use the entropy threshold to stop the model at various time points, you can wonder, can we model reaction times with this, human reaction times? And again, deep nets have been used to model human reaction times before, but typically what people do and what we've done certainly also is you take a hyperplane, you say, you, you know, is an, an object animate or not? Uh, you and then you fit a hyperplane for animacy and you take the distance from the hyperplane and then you correlate the distance from the hyperplane with the reaction times. And you hope that if the distance is larger, you get lower reaction times. So um, in a in an, you know, kind of evidence accumulation thinking, it means constant evidence and you reach threshold at various time steps. <clears throat> now with the recurrent models, we don't need to do that. We can just say, okay, say when and put an entropy threshold on it. We don't need to assume that the distance from the hyperplane is the evidence. We, it just has reaction times built in. So we contact a, another friend, uh, Jan Charest, uh, who is in Birmingham and now in, Mon in Montreal, um, who had a data set like that. He had, again, for the same 92 um, images, he asked people in the, in the lab to say, is this object animate or not? And you see you know, the distribution of reaction times here in the bottom. Uh, people had most, most struggle with the uh, head being photographed from the back or hair. Um, but, um, you know, we get a nice distribution of reaction times from this task. And now the question is, can we model this with our recurrent models? What we do is we train a readout for the model that does animacy, which is not something we've done before. We take a new data set, we, train, we fix all weights in the model. We only train the readout of the model to say, is it animate or not? And then we cross-validate and fit the entropy threshold to kind of mirror what the humans are doing, but it's all cross-validating. And this is what you get. This is how good um, so um, y-axis is how good the agreement is in the predicted reaction times versus the real reaction times. And you have various different models here. This is how good people predict people in terms of reaction times. It's a correlation of 0.4, let's say. And the recurrent models perform at like 0.25 or something. So it's, it's, it's quite a way from humans predicting humans. But of all the models that we've tested, the recurrent models outperformed significantly all of the other models that we've tested. And that includes some of the feed forward models. Um, How can well. you get a reaction time from a feed forward model? Thank you for Again, that question. By the entropy? Uh, yeah, so what we do here is the same trick, but we, tra we take the feed forward model and we train a readout at every single layer of the model. 
And now you can just pretend you check for the first layer that reaches the entropy threshold and you call the number of layers the reaction time. That's how we. How oh, we so you say even if a layer has millions of units in it, still you can still get an entropy for it, and when it yeah. becomes very peaky, you, you stop yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's it's like think of the think of the network, and we do a linear readout from every layer that we train specifically for each layer, and then we just ask which one of those is reaching this this threshold. It's a bit. Uh, I see, and the earlier the layer. You call that a shorter reaction time. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. okay. The That's network cool. could have used an earlier representation to do this task, let's say, um, at this for this image. That's clear. And they 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 do okay, but they do worse than the than the recurrent recurrent models. And it turns out something I'm not showing in this plot, but it's in the paper, and I should swap this plot. Is you can take also the the recurrent model and turn off weight sharing, so we have a very very deep model which otherwise has the same architecture. You just turn weight sharing off. And that's that's also much worse than the model that does weight sharing, that does proper recurrence, proper recurrence, well, weight sharing type of recurrence. Okay, um, with that, I think I'll hold, and um, this is called intermediate summary. It's my main summary. Um, um, so in in the lab that that we're running at at the Donners, we use deep learning as a shared language between ML and neuroscience. Uh, to We hope that at, at one point we can improve machine learning applications, but we can also use them to model and understand human information processing, which is predominantly what I've told you about today. Um, and I've, I've talked about recurrence, which we can use to better mirror neural population dynamics, reaction times, and we can you know, get a little better at, at in terms of computer vision performance at the same cost of parameters, let's say, or floating point operations. And with that, I will close and thank the lab and thank everyone. And I'm happy for additional questions if you have them. Thank you. I, I have a question. This is really a fantastic uh, uh, talk, uh, Tim. I had, I, I, this is kind of a uh, cheating question, but in reading your paper, your 2020 plus paper, you, do, you discuss the difference between unrolling in, in engineering oh, yeah. science and unrolling in biological times is not really exactly the same in how you match the two. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know people that haven't looked at the paper. It's... Yeah. Um, let me see what I have. A, I or might... we can talk informally after that. But I think to, to me, that's really kind of a, if one is going to try to do something with this, you know, understand. I would like that. to hear about it too. Exactly the that, main, yeah. I mean, the, the main difference really is that if you think of engineering, the feed forward inference of the model is instantaneous. You usually run it on your GPU and you once, you know, you pass through a whole model. And so if you have top down connections from, let's say, layer three to layer one, you could do that in one time step um, with engineering time. But in, in what we think of biological time, it, it, if you want to go from V1 to V3 and down again, it takes you one, two, three, four time yeah. steps, not one. Yeah. So the, the only change we're doing is that we say that top-down connections take two time steps. So if you go from V1 and two, V2, V2 and back, it takes two time steps instead of one. And so uh, but you if you're that computing that network on, G on your accelerator, it's going to take those time steps anyway, right? It's perfectly valid to, to compare those. I mean, you know, doing the inference on a big network on a even on an advanced accelerator, it takes finite time, like tens of milliseconds. Yeah, but doesn't it's that just, it's just semantic. I think for, for me, it's more a semantic element. If I if I say at time point two, if I put an image in at time point two, and I and I pretend that the model is is zero activated and naive at time point two, I would not want information from V two to go down to V one because it couldn't possibly have reached. In one time step v2 and up and and down again but it's i think you're looking at the wrong class of problems for, entirely for these uh recurrent networks you know you need to have a problem where like video i know you you would like to do video yeah. or problems where the, the yeah. uh, discriminations are difficult right it's only I, recurrence is only going to be activated for difficult borderline discrimination but it's a good oh, so, <laughs> so um yeah so well, first, first of all, we show here that even for static images, it can make a difference in terms of performance. Um, I think uh, for we've done, so Courtney has written a paper on occlusion and debris and showed that that works better with recurrent models. And the project that I wasn't able to show you today is that we now use movies and recurrent models and we look at energy efficiency in those models and, and predictive coding, which does take video input in recurrent models. So that's what we're doing now. Um, 
but it's, yeah, it's I think like, that's like what I wanted to say too. Since you're looking at animate versus inanimate, the first feature that comes to anybody's mind is motion. Yeah. Well, but yeah. humans are animals, and humans are incredibly good at just seeing these animal versus non-animal. You remember Simon Thor? Right, right, because they have yeah. faces versus non-faces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So movies are definitely. I mean, we're still in. In so part of uh, part of this is trying to again. This is a, a very much a top down approach. Is taking computer vision data sets and computer vision ways of solving it, changing it a bit to say by in biology actually a feed forward pass takes time. It's not immediate, and doing putting that in and taking then computer vision data sets to test this on. And if there were a great large scale data set on movies that we could use, I'd be happy to. Do this and again we do this now with arbitrary sequences but we put sequences into these models now and see there's a whole world of course that you can explore with recurrence because time you have access to time now which you didn't have before maybe friederman has a comment right i don't know actually i have a there. question can i also ask you questions <laughs> I, I i'm happy for everyone to ask questions so yeah, I was, I was still, it was very nice work. Thank you very much. I was still um, wondering about the recurrence that you put in the networks. And I think you said it, but it was a little bit too quick for me. So did you also explore different types of recurrence, like within layer, um, further lateral out? Uh, yeah. The scope um, of the and did you have top down recurrence too? In, in the yeah, model? so in this, in the stuff that I've shown you, we've done um, one particular variant, which is lateral connections and top-down connections, but just from adjacent layers. So there's no skip connections going from, you know, higher levels all the way down to V1 or so. It's always just the next layer can talk back to the previous layer in this case. And what we've done and, in and the... Does it have a, a receptive field size or a convolutional kernel there, or is this also yeah. all the... Yeah. So the, the unit is now not only defined by a kernel that's based on activations in the previous layer where you basically go over all feature maps and you have a local, you know, spatially local kernel that you learn, but um, you learn a kernel for activity that's in one layer up in the very same way or in, in your lateral surroundings as well. So it's, um, it's just the way that you connect this up. And I wish I, wait, let me try and... Um... And where, so where, really would you, where would you put the parameters there, like with regard to top-down versus lateral recurrence? Um, I'm not sure. Can you can you re repeat the question? Where would I put the parameters? I mean, they... Yeah, so you, you did this beautiful analysis of increasing the number of parameters, right? So... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, this is calling for more systematic... Uh, looks into it. What is skip connections, how big should the kernels be? What, what are you know different latencies there's a whole lot this was really a, a crude first step into into just adding information from a higher level and from um from lateral elements and we do some cooling experiments in the in the paper where we where we um stop units from responding oh sorry certain connection types lateral we freeze lateral connections and top-down connections and we see how well this this model can can still model human um brain data, this MEG data, and it turns out you need, you kind of need both. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's a, there's a whole lot to explore. This is really just a first little pointer towards people getting, being aware that this is totally a thing that you should maybe consider. Um, that's the, the whole point of the, the project really. So Cornelia was going to make some point about video there. I'm not sure if she still has that point. I mean, it's a little bit hard to, um, uh, you know, right now your method depends on getting lots of classes, right? It's a class that you pose as a classification. The network must yeah. classify something. Yeah. And that way you're able to use these tricks to train up your recurrent network. Is that correct? So if you, yeah, if you, no. if you pose yes, it with a no. regression problem, a simple regression problem like motion estimation, you wouldn't be able to get enough data. If you had like the moving, you know, the moving dots, uh, you know, where you have okay. this noisy moving dot things where you need dynamics to do the problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, question, it's hard to pose yeah, it, right? So in, yeah. in our case, we were we were lucky that we could use, you know, our my lab has introduced a large vision data set, eco set with of the 565 most common, most concrete English nouns 
that describe basic level categories, right? So it's one and a half million images. So this stuff we can use in, if we stick to But images. it's a static classifier, right? Um, Classification, yeah, I mean, not dynamics. Like, you, it's not, you it's not the do, uh, Magno pathway. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You could easily do um, you know, unsupervised objectives and whatnot, but you won't get motion. And one of the things where a postdoc of mine is exploring is, is we'll add eye movements to the, the static images to get um, some idea of, of motion, but it's Again. not the same as having actual videos coming in, um, obviously. It yeah. seems like this dynamics either is engaged when you're really at solving a difficult problem like vision at night when it's foggy and it's snowing and raining, or it's somehow when you're moving through the world. And you have to do motion parallax and yeah, but what I've shown you is, is background. But, but what I've but but what I've shown you in the make data is is very clearly recurrent dynamics that go beyond three hundred milliseconds in the human brain while you stare at a static image. So all those dynamics you're... weren't from the outside world. All those dynamics were from your brain figuring out what it is that it sees and and thinking of what the implications of it are. But it's sort of so, like you're showing that you get a slight improvement that way, but Simon Thorpe showed that, you know, you can easily classify uh, animal versus non-animal by EG within 150 milliseconds, just feed forward. I mean, you don't need yeah. that recurrence. Basically, you're not exercising, you're not pushing the cortex to where it, it must I, use dynamics. Yeah. So, so we have, so uh, multiple thoughts on this. One is um, we have done a, or we have an image, a paper where we train people to categorize, do a very simple categorization task in a parametric space. And we train them for 16,000 or so trials up 23 sessions. They have to come in every day. And we show that if you do that and you do the right projection methods and MEG, we can also train new categories up and get a hundred and something milliseconds until we get it perfectly in line with what, what Simon Thorpe showed for animacy. If you overtrain people to be very, very good at this task, um, then this this moves forward in time. So so I'm perfectly okay. happy with that. I don't think all so uh, what what Simon Thorpe is is showing is animacy is a superordinate categorization task. I could agree with. So De Carlo has shown readout of basic level categories in irrespective of translation and rotation. That's a hundred something milliseconds. Um, I still think that if you look at the human brain, there's a whole lot of other stuff that relates to semantics that goes beyond just classifying something. And that takes more time, more interactions with prefrontal cortex, all of that stuff is going on. And so even from an individual image, you can get all of these recurrent dynamics in human brain. Um, and and uh, that being said, even for images that if you take more natural images and you put them in, um, what, what Jim has shown in his previous work was that even in the latency of how, when you can decode things, there are some stimuli that just take a bit longer until you can decode them. And those are the more complex stimuli also, right? Where even for an individual object in natural background, you need more time. You need some recurrent computation. So it's not necessarily- No, 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 that's not true though for a spiking network. Uh, in a spiking, even in a feed forward spiking neural network, if the units are driven more strongly, the output will come out more quickly. Yeah. So if the units are fighting it out, even feed forward, and there's a competition between inhibition and excitation, it'll slow down the output. So you don't have to have recurrence for that to show up, right? It just how charging you, up the neurons you, faster you, will make the output come out faster. You mean in a, in a strictly feed forward manner where I listen to a yeah. previous layer? Even if I it's just feed inhibition. forward, right? A strong yeah. input that strongly drives the yeah. neurons will make the output come out quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that it's not a requirement to have recurrence for that. Phenomenon. Fair. But I, I mean, I, it's all really, it's really cool. That's why I'm asking all yeah. these questions. I no, think no, no, no. And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm all for, for, for lively, lively discussions. That's, that's, that makes talks interesting. So um, the, yeah, that, that's true. But I, I still stand by the, the statement that the dynamics, the prolonged dynamics that you see in the human brain data that last 300 something milliseconds. That's not just feed forward stuff yeah. waiting for 300 milliseconds till it reaches a threshold, um, I, would, I would argue. But, um, but I'm just that's interested. Why, that's why speaking to you guys is yeah. so important because, because you know, I'm not, we're at the population level using convolutional models or, you know, LSTMs and it's, it, 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 you know, um, they can be quite but again, different. Okay, I hate to dominate here. I like these conf LSTMs, which were developed originally. These conf LSTMs were developed originally 
as I understand, I'm not expert, but they were developed to uh, predict rainfall patterns, right? They were they did a much better job at predicting these precipitation patterns. And but you say as a model of cortex, they're bad because you cheat with these. No, memory no, 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 no. I'm saying if you would like to, if you would like to think of information flow and then a network can just a part of a network and just say i'll just memorize this and and shut itself off from the rest then i'm that makes me a bit suspicious that gives a lot of power to individual units in the network i see and so i, I would realize like that yeah if there's maintenance so and we we have done a lot of experiments where we show priming and these things in that's all not published work because we're too slow publishing things but um, one of the things in these BLT, so these, these lateral top-down connections, you get very strong priming effects um, where if the model is in the right state and you hit it with the next stimulus, you can get all these effects. But to go from stimulus one to stimulus two in the, in the, in the period in between, you have to have active maintenance in the model where activity has to circulate to be maintained. And I find that a bit more interesting than a model just saying, okay, now I'll close my eyes and just remember without any activity flowing, what my state was and re reactivate it in the next time. Cause that's- Yeah, no, no I understand it's cheating. And that, that's and that's that why way. I call it oh, cheating. That's the main but, reason. But what about the gating property? Sorry, one more question. I promise this will be the last one. What about the gating property of these um, GRUs? You know, basically this ability for units to non-linearly multiply the output by some uh, pattern, right? It's this non-linearity of multipl multiplicative uh, allowing the information to pass through. That, that seems quite um, biophysically plausible, right? And useful. You don't yeah. have that though explicitly, right? No, 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 no. For us, if, if you have any, any, you know, it needs to circulate. Um, and that's maybe, right. we can also call it a, a weakness, but I thought that it's, least, it's less assumptive, assumptive in, in going into it, I would say, into what you allow units to do. Ours are still literally doing a scale up product in a non-linearity. Thank um, you. I have a question. Thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, a question: uh, Do you do you foresee a path to a mathematical theory of what's going on here, similar to like what um, uh, Sachs, McClellan, and Gang Ganguly did for uh, uh, for linear models? Linear, right? Yeah. I'm kind of banking on Andrew for that. To be honest, <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I find it. I find these these systems so incredibly complex to understand, even to train them, because of all these nonlinearities and units reaching thresholds at various time points. I think they were quite smart to start with linear models and looking at, at training trajectories as a source of variation, mm -hmm. rather than the the performance of individual models. Um, stuff is all feed forward too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't see it in the near future, but there's the paper by Poggio thinking of ResNets and their relation to recurrent um, convolutional networks, um, which I find quite insightful. So there are people certainly operating this domain. Um, we're not a, an overly theoretical lab, so we're probably, I would love us to be more, but um, yeah. Fair it's, a, it's, okay. it's not a good answer. I, I don't foresee it anytime soon, but then things like, you know, connections from ResNets to recurrent models and the, the work by, by Andrew and, and Surya Ganguly and others is, is I'm hopeful that deep learning theory in general will progress so that we understand a bit better why things work and what mm -hmm. things work. And that will help us a lot in understanding cortical computations also, I hope. Right, all right, thank you. Yeah, just quickly follow up and um, on again what Toby was saying about the recurrence and the long time scales. So in a way, you know, there's all this short-term plasticity adaptation, and they're all on the time scales that you're talking about. They're also a form of recurrence if you want. They could store information. They wouldn't be this explicit recurrence through synaptic yeah. connections and activity, but they clearly have a strong effect and, and presumably they're useful. Yeah. I, I fully agree that, that that's the whole point of this, of this. Oh, oh yeah. So that's the whole point of, sorry, I need to, <clears throat> are you still there? Yes. Okay, good. Um, it just, my screen went blank, but that's because the host stopped, stopped my sharing. So 
Um, I fully agree. And the whole point of our top-down sort of approach to, to this is to take, let's make the least assumptions that we can and just to take scale-up products and Relus and see how far we get. And then adding more biophysical detail or, or this the, the sort of things you were talking about or fatigue mechanisms, all these things would be great next steps to look into to see how how, how the dynamics change. But we, we quite explicitly take this top-down approach into into things and you know, what you're suggesting is perfectly reasonable and 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 valid yeah sorry if i can't be more critical but that's i agree <laughs> be good thank you i really enjoyed it i thought it was an awesome talk Really provocative. I, mean, I love these feed, these recurrent networks and the idea of making them more cortical. Right? I think it's just really wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very. Thank you very much. This was this was a good discussion. I, I like it. It's a more it's more more uh, more friction than usual, and I love it. <laughs> well, let me. If you don't mind, I'll just explain why, as a neuromorphic or AI accelerator person, I consider it interesting to consider recurrence. The thing is, when we when we wanted when we started to build uh, accelerators to accelerate CNNs, one of the first things we thought of was to make them um, more like uh, cortex in the sense that they only propagate changes, hmm. right? Because then you can skip a lot of computation because a lot of in, when you're sending video in, a lot of the activity doesn't change between over time. Yeah. And what we discovered right away, this is in the uh, Samsung uh, neuromorphic processor product. We said, we'll make the CNN stateful. So we'll hold the memory of the CNN all the time and we'll only propagate if the uh, activity changes. The problem is that's completely useless for a feed forward network because now you have to read and write twice as much memory. Plus you have to hold the whole state in memory. Normally when you do a CNN, you just throw away the layer as soon as you use it, right? And then you reconstruct, in every frame you reconstruct the entire network. So it seems incredibly wasteful. But if you now just want to propagate changes through it, it's even more wasteful, it turns out because you have yeah. to do an incredible amount of memory IO just to uh, see if the state changed or not. But th that completely changes as soon as you make the, what you built there, which is a recurrent CNN. Now you must hold the state of the network. Yeah. And now you can benefit greatly by only propagating changes through it, right? Because you must read and write it anyway, mm -hmm. like you're doing on your GPU and you must hold the yeah. state all the time. So then it becomes much more like a spiking network. And I think that's really the future of these kind of networks, which are not, you know, sending frames to them, which are not correlated in time, it's not sensible. And in real world applications, they're going to get video as input. Yeah. Unless they're, yeah. you know, uh, doing some web analysis or something like that. Yeah. They're going to be on a car, on a plane, or, you know, as part of a It's a shame. I have the, I have the, we have the perfect project um, to, to speak about. And I, I jumped, skipped over it in the, in the talk where we have, uh, we take recurrent models and we, all we do is we train them on predictable sequences of input, yep. like a car driving down a road, or, you know, in our case, it's even simpler. It's sequences of MNIST or Safar. You know, you always go one, two, three, four, five, or, you know, whatever yep. sequence of Safar categories could be. self thing... Pardon? You basically self-supervise the learning. Right? Yeah, we, all we do is we train them to be, um, we put an L1 on the pre-activation, which means we train them to be as energy, what we call energy efficient as possible. We yep. want as few units active as possible. Yep. And if you do that, if you train a recurrent model to be energy efficient in a predictable world, what it does, it, it spontaneously separates into error and prediction units. And the prediction units hold in memory where you currently are in the sequence and they inhibit the incoming next digit <clears throat> and then automatically this network is then only propagating change uh, because it inhibits what it expects to be the next input and yeah, it, cool. it all does this stuff almost you know automatically where it, it's, it's very built. much like what we were exploring yeah that, that that's nice and it's also ideal for uh, future hardware you know implementation yeah when, yeah, when yeah. industry so finally thinks that there might be some advantage to this right which they don't right now yeah. So yeah, this this project is is really good fun. We we it's a bit provocative because we say if you you're a fan of predictive coding theory, you know actually all you need is energy efficiency, and then predictive coding will just emerge uh, from it. And uh, you, all you need is recurrence and energy efficiency in a predictable world. And then a lot of a lot of puzzle pieces fall into place without you actually having to hard code it. If you think of PredNet 
and these things, you know, networks, if I don't know whether you um, know, PretNet, it's a, PretNet is um, an explicit implementation of oh. predictive coding, where you take, you take your prediction, your world model and the prediction of your model, world model, and you explicitly subtract it from the input to only propagate change through the network, similar to, I think, similar to what you've described. And that builds in that assumption that you need to subtract the input and you only do change. And our point with this with this paper was to say, actually, if you want a system to be energy efficient or have as few units active as possible at a given time, it'll automatically inhibit the stuff that it can predict so that only change will propagate through because that's the only way how you can shut. So you have a few units, like a handful of units that keep track of where you are. That's your internal model, where you are in the, in the sequence. And those have very strong inhibitory drive and they very targetly inhibit the next frame that's most likely basically the median of the next category but Did you guys write um, that up yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a preprint that um is could you share done. it on the slack are you on the slack uh tim i am not it, yet because i it to me i'll share it share him the share link uh uh the share link of the slack is i'll generate a new one no, then it, you can just send it to me i'll share it on slack okay okay cool cool so it'd be nice if you share this stuff yeah there's a lot more material, so I hope we'll see Tim around in the future iteration of the workshop. Oh, way over time. Thank you so much. So, yeah, for sorry for taking so long, but it's 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 really your fault. <laughs> it's my fault. Yeah, it's entirely my fault. <laughs> but Keneally, I think that none of the topic areas had something planned for this slide, right? That's why we're going over time. Yeah, so we are good. It was very interesting. We're okay. There was nothing, there was no other speakers planned as far as I'm aware for this period. So that's why, you know, just you know. Selfishly, I, I, I enjoyed it very much. So, so thank you for having me. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. So uh, now, uh, I guess we'll stop the live stream right now because now we'll take a break before we have all the topic area meetings. Thanks, Photo, for organizing all this. It's so GG the topic area there. meetings are not here, right? They're on the channels. Yeah, they're on their individual channels. Okay. 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 So we'll meet here again tomorrow, same time. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>